Raising the Bets is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Raising the Bets, where a Catholic couple raising five kids outside of Boston. Join us as we share the joys and challenges of marriage, homeschool, and our adventures near and far as we make sense of the world and experience the best parts of our culture. I'm Don Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. Happy Epiphany, Melanie. Happy Epiphany, Don. So, yes, it is the piece of the Epiphany as we record. Uh, and the end of Christmas tide, but not the end of the Christmas season. I, I get confused with all these. So there's like there's the Christmas octave, then Christmas tide. And then Christmas season. I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, Epiphany marks into something. You know, it occurs to me that. Does it? When I would listen to Christmas music before Christmas during Advent, you would say, I prefer to listen to Christmas music during the Christmas season. I don't think you have once played Christmas music. I, in fact, I was just thinking about that this year. I have not really been, I'm not necessarily sure I would say I've not been in the mood for music, but if I'm going to listen, if I've been in the mood for listening to something while I was working, I've been much more likely to turn to an audiobook or a podcast and just, I think, I think honestly, I find our Christmas playlist a little bit tired. <laughs> It's I, only 11 hours of music, but no, yeah. I think that's part of it. It's it's 11 hours. I haven't updated it. I kind of want to take the time to add something new and fresh to it because I've listened to it like, uh -huh. you know, a bunch of times. And yes, I know we only listen to it once a year, but I listen, I've in the past listened to it on repeat nonstop for days on end. Right. And I just, there's not much new there. And there's several songs that I just kind of don't like that I kind of want to take out of it. So I have not been listening to the Christmas playlist. And there's also the variety of style from medieval Christmas chant to classical music to English choir to modern pop. It's, it's a whole gamut. And it's like it's jarring to go from one to the Sometimes next. Sometimes I like in the past, I have I have at times liked the eclectic feel of it yeah but i think that yes this year i have not been in the mood for something quite as eclectic but i have not had the time or the patience to curate the into a new list right so, so the addition of the star wars christmas album from 1978 didn't help not helping matters at all <laughs> what do you get a wookie for christmas when he's already got a comb <laughs> yeah not helping so yeah i I think what I would like to do is I, there was a time when I had a goal to find a new advent and a new Christmas album every year so that I would have mm. something new as well as something old. And I did not something blue. No, <laughs> this year I just, I didn't do that. And I don't uh -huh. think I did it last year either. And so I'm just kind of bored of the, yeah. of the playlist. And yet I found myself very excited to sing Christmas songs at church. And I was even singing them when we came home. But yeah, I wanted more Christmas music well, in my life this year. I just, yeah, I didn't do it. The hymns. I mean, the hymns are, are, are nice. Yeah. Like, you know, on Epiphany, you want to sing We Three Kings. And Definitely. My friend, my friend Jenny was complaining that he did not sing three, We Three Kings at Mass this morning. How could you not sing We Three Kings she was, on Epiphany? She, was, she felt cheated. And what I think are they rightly singing? so. Taste and see? I don't know. <laughs> but I, I would feel cheated too. Oh, they will actually, lick I, him up on Actually, I, I felt cheated. I felt cheated not getting all of the verses of We Three Kings because we didn't sing about myrrh and we didn't sing the final one about. Well, let's be clear. The whole We Three Kings is a very, it's a long, very long song. Thing. And well, Father and it, Leo stood there for quite a long time well, at the end of Mass. If, if, we, were, if we were singing um, We Three Kings at a normal pace, perhaps we could have got more of it. In. <laughs> well, this is true. We sang it at the dirge pace. 
We were mourning the three kings. Ooh. We three kings. It was like, come on, you're getting it at 33 and a half. It's supposed to be at 78. What? Okay. How many people in our audience even gets that reference? <laughs> Okay, I'm old enough to get that reference. Okay, yeah. if you if you got that reference, you are you are uh, definitely old. You are mm -hmm. categorically old. Yeah. All right, so uh, let's catch up on what's been going on. Last time we talked, I mentioned how my mom had been in the hospital uh, and had was getting better, but was she had been to the hospital from the nursing home. So in the inter intervening time, she was released. I mean, it was at one point we we're like, this is it. This is she's we're gonna lose her now. And then several days later, she rallied. It was, she rallied and she went back to the nursing home. And then two days later, she went back to the hospital. So she's back in the hospital and she's been in the ER for two days. She's still in the ER. I, she I'm really pretty sure that. she's still. Yeah. They haven't found her a room yet. It's really crazy right now. That's she, yeah. really crazy. Different hospital from the one she went to last time. And she's getting the grand tour of the Boston hospitals, apparently. Oh, dear. Um. So uh, not sure what's going on. We think they still think it might be COVID still like last, like two weeks ago, they thought it was COVID. So I don't know. The doctors are kind of flailing. We're kind of at that stage. I hate to say this in all seriousness, where we're just kind of waiting. She is, she is declining. She is, it's, it's a long, slow process of decline and it's, you know, inevitable at some point. I don't know. Is it a week, a month, a year? No, no one can say no one knows. Only God knows that we're going to lose her. And so we just, we're kind of, and I know a lot of people understand this and have been through this themselves or are going through it, but you just in this long open-ended at some point she's going to die. And, I don't know when that will be. And then when she does, we'll drop everything and mourn and celebrate her. And then we'll return to our life. So I, I don't mean to, to get down or anything, but, uh, you know, it's just, it's hard to, to, to for people, you know, and, and until you go through it yourself, it's, I mean, I've always sympathized and known people who've gone through it and sympathized with them. But then to be in that situation, it's very different from with my dad. My dad was, you know, old, elderly, but he was vital, still getting around. And then one day he didn't feel so well, went to the hospital, he keeled over. Yeah. You know, it was sudden. And for my mom, it's going to be drawn out. Not sudden. So, <clears throat> so that's my mom update. And uh, so what else has been going on? The boys went camping this past weekend. This was a winter camping trip and included a night out in a tent for Anthony as part of his uh, merit badge, his camping merit badge, they had to spend a night out below freezing. And uh, so he did last night. He slept in a tent with the, one of the other scouts. Uh, he was all bundled up in the winter uh, sleeping bag that I got last time, after, after last time when Ben and I slept out, and I was never as cold as that in my entire <laughs> life. I, mm -hmm. I, like, I've been in colder weather, but trying to sleep when it's 11 degrees and like I am bundled in every piece of clothing I have and I'm just cold and just not, not warm. Oh, that was, that was a rough night, but not so bad for him. It was interesting. They, they went to this particular, uh, scout camp, camp, you know, campground, campground. It's not really campground. It's, they don't call it a campground for some reason. Scout camp, uh, called Knobscott which is, uh, so they had to hike in from the parking lot into the woods. So it was about a quarter mile, half mile in. I think it was, I think it was like a quarter mile. But it was, <laughs> I went this morning to go pick him up. I got, I got up at 5.30 this morning to, to drive, go pick him up, and uh, be back in time for mass. And I get there, and I have, and I have to, I didn't hike in with them, you know, the, the other day. I let them hike in, but I had to go hike in to go get them. And it was like straight up a hill. <laughs> like I had to stop halfway up. I'm like, I'm too old for this. This is why I didn't go on this camping trip. So they had to carry everything in on their back. There was no extra stuff. So uh, they, I think they had that they, they did well. The scout, the scout leaders were telling me that they did pretty good. 
Um, is the usual have to yell at the kids. I mean, 12, 13 year old boys get to get yelled at all the time anyway, especially when they're in a pack, like a group. Um, but they, they said they had fun. Uh, so that was good. They were very tired today though. Yes. At least Ben was very tired. Yeah. And then, you know, immediately pick them up, drive down the street and there's a Dunkin' Donuts. Well, it's Massachusetts. There's a Dunkin' Donuts on every quarter mile. Yeah. So we drove down and we got some hot chocolate and a donut for them each and that warmed them right up. Mm hmm. So uh, and then today's epiphany. So as we've talked about each year as on this podcast, we celebrate according to your family's tradition of a of gift giving and we mentioned on christmas uh we get a, santa gives gifts on christmas but it's family gifts are on epiphany and that's really where the most gift giving gets done yeah that's where my family like does more of the family get together like my brothers i don't think they went to visit my parents at christmas christmas day my parents just it was the two of them um but today my, both my brothers and my sister-in-law went to my parents' house for dinner. Where's your sister? Is she still in My Dells? sister did not go down. She she was there for the baby shower, and then she went back to Dallas and spent Christmas there, and she did not come back down for a Okay, yeah. Um, she's sickly. Yeah. Um. So what do you think of the gifts for the kids? Um. Good. I saw a, I aimed at a book or two plus something to wear yep. for each of them. And then various other articles, small things that like as individual children wanted, like Anthony got a timer because he had said that he wanted a timer and he got some magic trick. A, a deck cards. of cards, a magic, magic deck. Um, Not magic the gathering, like playing cards that are for magic tricks. Right. Like the kind that are marked so that you can do like, yeah. wow, your friends. So I, I'm going to, Teach him to take it with him on the scout trip so he can make some side cash off the scouts. Yeah, totally. Yeah, cheating, cheating the other scouts. That's really Not cheating, doing amazing. No, no, no. Card like trips. playing poker, but you, since you can tell what all the other c cards are, you could totally cheat. No. <laughs> Anthony would not be able to pull that off. <laughs> he wouldn't. <laughs> Ask me how I know this. We had a deck of these when I was a kid. Did you <laughs> cheat? No, 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 no. I didn't. Okay. We didn't play. Because you'd be like staring at they had the the marks are really small. You'd be like staring intently at the cards of your opponent, back of the cards of the opponents. They'd be like, "What are you staring at, dude? Nothing." So, uh, so he also got a connects. That was for, from my from, your, from, from your my parents. parents. Yeah, he. I think he loves that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see, Bella got she got new headphones, noise canceling headphones. Those from your mom. Your my, mo my mom, yeah, got her some really nice noise canceling headphones. Um, we got Bella two Hamilton shirts. Yep. Um, and a couple of books, and hat. Oh, and a, and a yeah, a really nice uh hand knit hat that I bought on Etsy. Nice. She she had been particularly wanting a new hat because the one she had was more than five years old, I think. Oh yeah. She she'd had it for a long time, and she kind of wanted something a little bit more stylish, stylish, and more six. Teen going on 17 rather than 11 going on 12. Yeah. When she would, it's, a, it was sort of like a Heidi hat. Like it had long tails and yeah, and flat. it was, it was cute. It was hand knit, but it made her look like 12 years old when she wore it. <laughs> yeah. The, the new one is, is much more. Yeah. Stylish. Uh, Sophie got an Anastasia shirt, like the, the musical, the musical Anastasia uh, and some fleece pajama pants, which she was thrilled with. Yep. Uh, and uh, what, what else? She got some books. Some books and. Oh, uh, Star Wars. A Boba, a really nice black series Boba Fett. Yep. From my parents. Yep. Yeah. And then let's see, Ben got some books. He got a, a map maker's guide for like making like D&D &D or maps. fantasy maps. Yeah. Yeah. I I like that. That's cool. Um, and then he got uh, oh a ba balaclava hat helmet. Yep, Big hat hat balaclava, the you know ski mask sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and Which she put on and then didn't take off for like hours. <laughs> <laughs> Buddy, you're gonna get overheated if you don't take that off. So you got a Boba Fett shirt. Um, yeah, and then uh, Lucy got some really nice action figures, Star Wars action figures. And some books. She got the Mysterious Benedict Society series uh, box set. Uh, she, and then um, 
penguin shaped snow mold. So it, if if it actually snows at some point in this winter, uh, knock on wood, it doesn't. Uh, but if it did snow here, when uh, it snows. Oh. That's a whole nother topic, but uh, they we can make like snow molds of penguins along to guard the house, like along yes. the sidewalk. I think that would be fun. Um, and then so, so it, needs, it yeah. need, now it needs to snow so they can use their penguin snow molds. Yeah, they can also do all the shoveling. They're old enough now. They are. Uh, Sophie also got the penguin water bottle. Oh yeah, super cute penguin water bottle. Very very cute. Um, yeah, so it was nice. And then I got you a few things. Yeah, uh, some several books, uh, two Malcolm Geet uh, collections of poetry and uh, Meg Hunter Kilmer's uh, Book of Saints called Pray for Us and some really nice kitchen uh, floor mats. And? Oh, and a pretty hat. I'm wearing it right now. <laughs> I, see, I, I, I didn't think of it because it's on my head. Yes, which is funny because as we're heading up to mass, you couldn't find your hat, your other hat. And you're like, oh, I wish I had a, I wish I had another hat I could wear when I couldn't find that one. And I was so tempted to say, oh, just run in and grab your present. But I'm like, no. And so I made you suffer. I was fine. <laughs> I just brought my big shawl and put it over my head when I got too cold. Yes. Like a little Ben said, I looked like a Russian babushka. Sort of. Yeah. Or Italian. Is it, it isn't. It's actually a, 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 a scarf. It's kind of almost but almost so big that it's a shawl. I bought it in Florence when I was in college. And I, I so I've had that for like 30 years. Oh, I bought it in Florence at this little shop. It was gorgeous. Yeah. <laughs> I used Wish it, I could say it. I used it as Florence. a blanket while sleeping on trains during my grubby college days. <laughs> <laughs> now I wear it to church as my fancy like church going shawl. You know, uh -huh. it's it's versatile. Yes. It's warm, it's wool, it's beautiful. So, uh, and then you gave me a couple shirts. Uh, I got a Doctor Who shirt, which if you watch the Secrets of Doctor Who, uh, come, let's see, this episode that we record will be out next, uh, beginning of February, like the first week in February. Uh, you'll see it on the video. I'll, I'll wear it to, uh, for the recording. And also, oh, a Prancing Pony shirt, the Lord of the Rings Prancing Pony. Prancing Pony, the inn that the hobbits stop in and brie. It comes in pints. Which is, which is not from the book. From the book, we all, we must specify the things when you, when you code things that are not from the book. You must. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's move on to talk about some food we've been cooking. And one new recipe that we had was Swedish meatballs. Ikea Swedish meatballs specifically. Mm. The recipe, interestingly, came from CNN.com. CNN.com? Seriously? Yes. I forget why I found it. I, I think someone referenced it somewhere in social media and said, yeah, this is totally like the Ikea. They taste like Ikea Swedish meatballs. And, you know. Oh, it's well, it is the recipe. In fact, it's the official recipe that Ikea released now that I look at the article. And what'd you think? They were good. They were very, very good. They are tasty meatballs. <laughs> so a couple of notes, and I'll put a link to the to the the article, the CNN article with the recipe in it um, in, in the show notes. But a couple of things. The gravy came out thick. You you could have thinned it a bit, yeah. I should have used a little more broth. So whatever amount of broth they call for, uh, they use they say vegetable and beef broth. Uh, so just add a little more, thin it out. Um, it it calls for a finely chopped onion and and minced garlic in the meatballs, but I feel like it would be easier <laughs> to just use great garlic powder and onion powder, or you could great great well, food process it. I, I would do it in the food processor. That's what I usually do for my meatballs and meatloaf. Yeah. Or even if you have an immersion blender, do it in that. Yeah. I, I, I feel like that the hand chopped was fine. It, it, it didn't actually it bother chunks. me. It yeah. did not bother me. That no, it didn't chunks. bother me too much either. Um, it was the forming of them that made it a little bit of an issue. Right. But, but yeah, I would totally just throw, throw the onions and the, and the, in the garlic, garlic in the food processor, and just along with the breadcrumbs, actually would have yeah. been because uh, we had the we had homemade breadcrumbs that we used that that worked out, but it was really good and really good the next day. 
uh, we didn't have light lingonberry jams, but we had leftover cranberry sauce from Christmas. So we, we, uh, ate it with that. It was really good with the, it was so good with the cranberry sauce. Yeah. I will totally make this again. This was a really good, so it's, um, ground two. It's like two thirds ground beef Two. let's see. How do you do the ratio? Two parts, two parts, ground beef to one part ground pork. Basically, uh, so it, it's not so heavy like a, like a all beef meatball would be. Um, there's egg, milk um, in the meatball. And then for the cream sauce, it's butter, equal parts butter and flour. Uh, you get equal parts vegetable and beef stock. Then thick double cream. I think that's the, the, heavy cream. It's heavy cream. It's kind of funny. And there's also a little bit of soy sauce in Dijon, uh, which gives you the umami and a little bit of that soy f- sharpness um, and the emulsifying effect of the Dijon. The recipe is clearly a European recipe because, you know, they have grams, but also pounds for the for the measurements, which is kind of fun. Um, and they say things like double cream as opposed to whipping whipped cream or heavy cream. So that was really good. Uh, also, you made for today, you made a king cake. I or did. Epiphany. Um, used random recipe that I found online. I think it might have been Betty Crocker even. Yep. Um, I'm still looking for the perfect king cake recipe. So I sort of try a new one every year. Um, this one had. I mean, I, I modified it severely. Because I wanted to make a cream cheese filling. So I borrowed the cream cheese filling from somewhere else. But one of the things that I noticed was that this recipe and one other that I looked at when I was hunting for recipes. Instead of having you uh, after you've mixed kneaded the dough, instead of having you put it in a warm place to rise, it has you put it in the refrigerator to chill and retard the dough. So that it doesn't rise. So it does not rise. And so I did that and it actually worked out really well. So I think that might be the key. Um, My cream cheese filling this time did not spill out all over the pan and then stayed nicely in the king cake. And oh, it tasted good. It was a little bit doughy in the middle. I still have not solved the putting a cream cheese filling in and then cooking it for long enough for some reason. The cream cheese filling always ends up being a little bit doughy in the center. Mm. But other than that, it was good. I put a little bit of almond flavor in the cream cheese filling. And then I put a orange flavored cream cheese on the top. So it was like double cream cheese. Mm. I really like cream cheese. You know, we were listening on the way back from the camping trip. We were listening to the Milk Street podcast. Mm -hmm. And there was a special episode where they were you know, helping people fix or recover family heirloom recipes, you know, handed down from great grandma, that sort of right. thing. And I'm thinking, you know, I should call in and tr- so to help me figure out whatever that thing is that my aunt made. It's not caponata. It's not caponata. It's she called it, and this this is phonetically what my memory is. Gabagaliwi. That's what my dad called it. No. Whether that's an actual Sicilian slang or otherwise word, I don't know. But it had olives. It was a relish. It had olives and celery and all this other umami blasting sweet and sour, which is a classically Sicilian thing. It was just I remember being mind blowingly delicious when I was 10 or 12 when I tried it. Um, I think, I think we were visiting, I was visiting my aunt's house with my dad at lunchtime once in the summer, maybe. I don't remember the context. And she like put it out and my dad was eating, put it on some bread and I put it on some bread and I loved it so much. She gave me the jar to take home because I, wow. I was so enthusiastic about it, but I have no idea what it is. And I, I've, I've been trying to discover it and I've tried a million caponata recipes and it's not caponata. I like caponata. It's fine, but it's not this. So uh, if anybody knows, if anybody, if, if a listener to this podcast happens to uh, know what this Sicilian dish is, I would love to know it. Maybe I should ask my friend Dave. Yeah, yeah he maybe married he's a Sicilian woman. He's lives, lives in Sicily. No, part time. I, I actually don't know. I think he's still living in Dallas, but. 
a friend of Melanie's who um, is a doctor who spent part of every year in this little Sicilian village to the point where he ended up becoming part of the community and married a woman from the town. Yeah. He, he went to Sicily like in college, uh, part of his semester, abro- his semester abroad mm-hmm. and loved it so much that he kept going back after graduation and um, ended up doing like charitable work in the town and just f- loved the people there. And evidently married, met the love of his life there. So it's kind of (laughs) awesome. It's it's fun. All right. So that's what we've been eating. So uh, you can find the links to the recipes uh, such as they are on the, on our show notes. Uh, You'll have to figure out Melody's modifications to the king cake, uh, but we'll put the original king cake recipe that she used as the basis there. Yeah. So let's talk about stuff we've been reading or watching. Um, I'm going to run through a couple of things quick just because uh, I get a lot of stuff that I watch for some reason. So I watched, there's a new series on Disney Plus called National Treasure based on the Nicolas Cage movies. Uh huh. But it's not the same thing. But it's not really. <laughs> it involves people hunting down historical treasures. I think that's the connection. Okay. Uh, but instead of Nicolas Cage, it's an undocumented immigrant, um, 20 something and her friends. Okay. Yeah. Hunting for the, although the Masons are a key part of it because, you know, we have to have a, it's a conspiracy. So national treasure has to involve a conspiracy of right. something. Um, it's definitely aimed at teens. I, I watched one or two episodes. I don't think I'm going to watch any more of it. Uh, it's tip. It's very typically aimed at teens with that sort of hip thing. Lots of references to YouTube channels and TikTok, And um, there's a lot, there's typical chronological snobbery where of course, you know, people in the past were, um, you know, uh, primitive and backwards and, uh, we we are you know the modern modern people are so much more knowledgeable and smarter and all this other stuff. But there's also this uh, some of the cultural snobbery going on as well. Um, uh, Catherine Zeta Jones is in it as the bad guy. Interesting. She's um she's at that stage in her life where she's no longer the the young fem feminine heroine. Uh-huh. She's now like femme fatale, older like. She's older than me, so, yeah. Still, I mean, Catherine Zeta-Jones, she still looks great, but... Of course. Uh, but, yeah, she's at a different stage in her acting career. So that's that. I, I'd give it a miss, unless you get teens who'd like that sort of thing, maybe try it out. It seemed innocuous enough. There wasn't anything offensive in it. I finished the third season, I think it is, of the Jack Ryan series on Amazon Prime. Continues to be excellent. Not a whole lot of connection to the books, the Tom Clancy books, um, except the character names and the general situation of a CIA analyst. Um, he's a bit more of an action hero in this than the, the book Jack Ryan is. But the values and principles involved in this, he's still an idealist, a virtuous um, sort of idealist and uh, brilliant. John Krasinski is doing an excellent job uh, as as Jack Ryan. You know, if anything, you convinced me to watch it. I'm not really. I mean, I liked the Harrison Ford Jack Ryan. Yeah. Um, I I like John Krasinski. So oh, so do I. I. I mean, that might actually induce me to go go and watch them. I'll watch John Krasinski in anything. He has turned out to be sort of like um Chris Pratt, who went from sitcom comedy guy to action hero. Uh huh. Same with with John Krasinski. It's kind of fun. Also, Wendell Pierce, who plays uh, Jim Greer in it in the books, he's Admiral Greer, um, is really good. I really like him in this. This is good. It was it was it was a good se- uh, season. Um, I think better than the last one. Uh, I think I would I would say that. So yeah, I would, I would agree. Uh, I you had already watched Enola Holmes too. I did, and I so I watched it to catch up, and I agree with your assessment. It's Popcorn costume drama. Um, uh, Millie Bobby Brown is delightfully quirky. You know, she's she's cute and bubbly. Um, um, Henry Cavill is always great to watch on screen. 
I mean, let's face it, he's a handsome man, but he's also kind of fun as Holmes. It's an, I wouldn't have pictured him as Sherlock Holmes, but he does a pretty darn good job of it. I, I, I think it was, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, there's a whole lot of, you know, girl power going on in this movie. It's very much a girl power. Girls can do anything you can do. Um, and the 19th century or was very mean to girls sort of thing, which was kind of like the Jungle Cruise. It's it seems to be a theme in Hollywood to whenever we do a historical drama, we have to show how that era was bad to women. I guess. Uh, but, you know, it was it, it was popcorn and don't take it too seriously. There's a new series on Disney Plus about um, called Willow, which is a sequel to the 1988 movie, uh -huh. which was written by George Lucas. Right. And I, I remember seeing the movie in the theater, but I couldn't tell you much about it. So I want to watch the series. And we recently had an episode of Secrets of Movies and TV shows on the movie. And I said, I want to I wanted to go back and watch the movie because I don't think I'd seen the movie since 1988, frankly. Right. Because uh, it was it was I, I remember at the time kind of being disappointed. You know, George Lucas is making right. he's going to do for fantasy stories what he did for Star Wars science being, fiction. Right. I remember being mildly disappointed. Like it was OK as a fantasy movie, but it wasn't like when I needed to see it again and again. And it was directed by Ron Howard. Right. Which was early Ron Howard, so he hadn't really, really hit his stride yet. So I watched it. There was this aesthetic in the 80s sword and fantasy magic sort of movies uh -huh. of barrenness. It, like it was like they didn't they didn't have big budgets apparently, so they had these like isolated little castles and villages and then barren emptiness everywhere in between. And it was, it, it was really, it felt like a kind of an empty world. And the special effects were really mediocre, even for the time they were not good, uh, frankly. And um, they, it was an interesting decision to use um, little people as uh -huh. the, the hobbit stand-ins the their halflings or whatever you want to call them right instead because later on peter jackson would use technology to make regular sized people small but at this time the best they could do was just you know bring in little people and in fact a lot of the actors were like oh i've seen these all those guys were in time bandits <laughs> you know uh -huh. billy Barty was in it who's one of the most famous uh, little people uh, actors um so it was it was good um in that sense uh val kilmer was in it and all right i remember him being the like mad martigan yeah um he was all right um gene marsh played the scene chewing villain she was really good um as a scene chewing villain so it was it was all right um it was worth watching again it's on disney plus i didn't have to pay for it or anything like that but yeah um, I'm still interested in seeing the series and seeing what that looks like 30 years later, 30 years of storytelling advancements later. Right. Like, do they do it, make it more interesting, more? I gotta be honest, like the dark crystal, uh huh. when they, so Netflix has the new dark crystal series and it was okay. It was just, it was just okay. I watched, I never even finished the season, frankly, because I kind of lost interest most of the way through i mean i got pretty far in the season but kind of lost interest and so i'm wondering whether whether we can recapture or whether it's even worth recapturing like there was something about dark crystal that was interesting at the time i didn't i did not like dark crystal at the time it was the muppet thing i think the puppet thing made it interesting right i i just remember not really be like I th I thought the aesthetics of the Dark Crystal were interesting, but when it came to actually watching the movie, I think I fell asleep when I was a kid. Right. Like watching it on video, I do not I do not have good memories of it. I right. just I sort of remember being wanting to be interested, but actually being bored. Yeah, I can I can see that, and. And it's like with Willow too. Willow was interesting for the time because we hadn't had Lord of the Rings yet, you know, 
I mean, before Lord of the Rings, there were a lot of, there's a, a bunch of this sort of movie in the 80s. Right. Um, Excalibur. Labyrinth. Labyrinth. Um, oh, what was the one? I just had one and it went out of my head. Um, but Legend. Yeah. With Tom Cruise. Lady Hawk. Lady Hawk. Yeah. So you had, you know, these sword and fantasy magic sort of things, but they all were similar. Conan the Barbarian, which is kind of a great movie, but. Um, never, never saw it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but yeah, I mean, but it went, for what it was, it it was OK. I mean, it, and actually, if I went back and watched it now. I might not think it's a great movie. But, you know, when I was a 16 year old boy, it was awesome. It was the greatest thing ever. Um, so. But but now we have all this modern stuff and it really I think it it really says, wow, like how far we've come. Rings of power, wheel of time, you know, the, the, the more recent things, they have really far surpassed what they could do back then. And the, just the world building is so much better anyway. So that was Willow, the 1988 version. Um, then together as a family, we watched these two episode season premiere of Bad Batch season two, long awaited. Yes. So yes. Um, what'd you think? Um, it wasn't, I mean, it was, it was good. It wasn't quite as thrilling and as exciting as I was kind of hoping. It felt more like continuation of the cartoon, like it, if you, Bad Batch feels more like a cartoon series and less like the kind of storytelling that you get in even Rebels and Clone Wars. Right. It's a little bit more episodic. The stakes don't feel quite as high and the story arc well, doesn't feel quite as. At the end of season one, it felt like it was moving more toward a grander storytelling, an arc. Right. But it feels like with these, at least these first two episodes. It kind of felt like we went back. Yes. Backwards instead of leaning into what I was liking about where Bad Batch was going. It felt like we'd kind of gone back to what it was in the beginning. And I was a little bit disappointed. Not really disappointed. Like I, I enjoyed it. I I don't. I mean, this is why I'm hesitating, because I don't want to say it wasn't good it didn't blow my socks off. And I was kind of, especially right. having just finished watching Andor, which oh. did blow my socks off. Yeah. Bad Batch felt like. Conventional. If it was safe. It was fun, but both of the, both of the, the two parts were really just sort of one, one, story, story. one yeah. story broken into two parts, which is why they released them at the same time. And it felt like it was very much an episode. Yeah, there there was a there was a mission. They went on the mission. They completed the mission. We we moved the story forward incrementally by by the space of one mission, but we did not do a whole lot of moving the greater story forward. The the greater story being, what are the Bad Batch going to do with themselves? Like right now, they're just doing missions for Sid in order to survive to to well to pay the bills. They introduced an element that I think will bear out through the season of, are we just going to keep doing these missions? And that might be why this, uh, these two episodes were like this. Are we just going to keep doing these missions for Sid or are we going to cut, you know, use our skills to combat the injustice of the empire? Right. And so they've, I think that they're, if you notice the trailers for this season, almost all of the trailers came from these two episodes. Like they don't want to blow what they're doing. Right. Exactly. I, right. I feel like, right. And that's the thing is I feel like this could have been, this could be a setup for a really interesting season. Yeah. But they didn't jump. They didn't hit the ground running. Yes. It very much feels like a setup. And maybe they felt they needed to do that for storytelling purposes, especially because the audience for the Bad Batch is younger well they also they use this these two episodes to set up a few things one this question are we going to do more two where is omega in her in her growth what did what is she she's changed now from last season right she's much more a part of the team in a way i think that 
there almost has to be a pause because Omega was so young in the original that there was things that they just couldn't do while she was such a such right. a young character. I mean, I just I think logistically it would be hard to tell the kind of story that I want them to tell with a very young child. Yes. And I feel like Omega is hitting more of the preteen years where mm-hmm. she's a little bit more competent and she's found her foot. Like the the first season was very much a lot of it was Omega's story as she's never been off the planet Camino. She doesn't know who she is. And it's about her finding her place in the world. I feel like this second season is maybe going to open up and be less about like the bad batch on the run and Omega finding her place in the world. And maybe now it's more as a coherent unit, a group finding their collective mission. So the, excuse me, the big thing that I think it is still the, the big unanswered question is where is the bad batch in rebels and in the, you know, rogue one and following Right. Why don't we see them in those? Now, obviously, it's because these were made after those. those but they have to explain why they aren't in the story. And that's the looming question that needs to be answered by this series. Plus, I really, really want a redemption arc for Crosshair. <laughs> Everybody else in our family says they think that, especially Sophie, whose favorite character is Crosshair, she's not so sure that he's going to get a redemption arc. Yeah. Or she thinks that if they do, it'll be a deathbed conversion sort of redemption arc where where we see Crosshair finally reconciling to th- with the other members of the Bad Batch, but only as he dies, like maybe in sacrificing his life for theirs, which I think would be sort of. It's a redemption arc. It would be redeeming. A very short arc. It would but... be somewhat satisfying. But I really want him to just rejoin them to to, to, to make them, the team whole again, to make the team whole again. I will not be happy unless that happens. And I'm just going to say that right now so that if it does or doesn't, I'm on the record. <laughs> you know, with the, all the talk of the characters from Star Wars Rebels, some of them anyway, showing up in live action in Ahsoka series. And, you know, so get, getting this crossover from animation to live action Mm-hmm. I wonder, do we do we want to cross over to live action for the Bad Batch? See, I think the trick is they can't do a crossover until you get an Omega who is older, I think. Oh, unless yeah. they're planning to do something that's like every year because the problem with child actors is Oh, yeah, I don't they get old too fast. No, no, I'm and I'm thinking a crossover where the, it's much later. Much later, I would be. It I would can't be, be. It can't be the um, like Force Awakens time, but it might be like post Jedi, Ma- the Mando verse, as they call it. I I could be. I could be happy with a Bad Batch Mando verse crossover at some point. Um, I do think that like, yeah, we need to get Omega to the point where the actress she's an adult yeah she's an adult and the actress is not going to age out of playing her i mean the thing is nice thing about animation is you can have an animated character stay a kid for a lot longer well she's also a clone so there's some question of what does that mean for aging too well yeah Um, and frankly technically she's older than the bad batch she is yes that came up at the end of season one she was she was born first but the clones the clone troopers oh, wait, they were, were all artif- artificially aged. They were artificially, uh, yeah, sped up. Yes. And she wasn't. Yes. For some reason. And, this, and that's the, her, the, her re- you know, reason for existence. That's all is still an open question. Right. We still don't really Why? know who. Why is Omega? <laughs> 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 to paraphrase. <laughs> Drex. Drex. Why is Omega? <laughs> And that's a question. And what does she maybe have to do with Grogu? Because remember, at the end of season one, the surviving K- Kaminoan was taken to the cloning facility where the symbol that they wear is the same as the symbol as the scientist who was trying to get a hold of Grogu. So you think that there's going to be a Mando, Grogu, Omega, Omega connection? That could be really interesting if they do that. Yes. I mean, I... I like the Bad Batch. I think it's a 
fun show. I think it has a lot of potential that has not yet been tapped. And I really hope that they tap it. Like I loved it when Finnick showed up. Yep. That, so there, that is actually a Mandoverse crossover. It's the beginning of it. Um, because, because it could be a connection point. Because Fennec is definitely a connection point between the two shows. There was a lot of people who thought that Omega would show up in the book of Boba Fett. I, She's technically Boba Fett's sister. Right. Um, the other thing... Well, there could be a book of Boba Fett season two. There could. I don't think that was ever planned, but it's possible. Um, the other one thing that happened in season one was Hera showing up, which was fantastic. Oh, I absolutely adored that. So, yeah, there have been some good crossovers with Bad Batch so far. I mean, yeah, I think that there's more. I, I'm looking forward to this season because I think that there's a lot that they could do with it. And yeah, I'm I am optimistic, despite my slight disappointment. <laughs> For more on the Bad Batch season, uh, episodes one and two, you should check out the secrets of Star Wars because they're talking about that this week. Uh, but let's move on to talk about the last movie type thing we've watched, which was uh, an Amazon, uh, no, Apple. Apple TV plus movie called the greatest beer run ever. It was fun. It was fun. It was just a good movie. I was intrigued by it because I'd heard it had a screening at the Vatican with Pope Francis. Okay. I did not remember that when we were watching it. I, yeah. That would have maybe changed a few things like because I would have been thinking about why. OK, so the main character is Catholic. Yes. And it was based on a true story. So it's based on the life of a real. Catholic John Chicky Donahue. Chicky is such an interesting. They never explained the Where he got the nickname. The, the nickname. Yeah. So he's kind of at the beginning of the, the movie. It takes place in 1967. Right. So it's in the height of the Vietnam War. He's kind of a near do well. He's was. Let me read the the, the plot summary and then to to kind of get that. Former Marine John Chicky Donahue was a slacking merchant seaman who lives with his family in the very close knit neighborhood of Inwood in New York City and likes to hang out at a bar operated by a somewhat cynical old man double dubbed the Colonel. Um, Chicky's sister is strongly opposed to the Vietnam War. She's a protester. But Chicky and her father, who are both veterans, um, are strongly supportive of the war. And they find when they Chicky and the and the the boys in the neighborhood, they find out that one of their buddies who's over there has died. And uh then another one, his his best friend, Tommy, is MIA. Is MIA. And at, after the funeral, there a few beers into the bar, uh, at the bar, and they come up with this idea that, or he does, comes up with this idea that we need to show the boys we support them, the boys from from home, from this neighborhood, that we support them. We should bring bring them a beer from home, and so that that's where the greatest beer run ever comes from. And so he's a merchant seaman. So he says, well, you know, Hey, if I can get a ship over to Vietnam, I'll, I'll take a duffel bag full of beers and I'll visit each one of the, there was like five different guys. I bet in real life it was more, but there was like five different guys and I'm, he's going to go visit each of them to bring him a beer. And it becomes a little bit more real when the Colonel hands him a duffel bag from the, like a, like a, Sports bag, like a hockey bag with the bar's name on it. So like right. the bar probably so, so then it suddenly the here's team. here. The first step is here's the bag you're going to take. It's still very much a drunken boast at the bar, though, until the moms show up. The moms of the boys who are over there. And they show up with things that they want him to deliver to their sons and with words about how proud they are of him. And what guy can resist your best friend's mom? Well, his best friend who's missing, his mom shows up with a rosary, asking him to bring Tommy this rosary that he left behind. Right. And she says he probably brought one, but maybe not. And anyway, even if he already has one, it won't hurt him to have another set. <laughs> yes. And Chicky's like, he d- he's he had made this drunken boast of the bar. He's He was never... It's clear 
he wasn't necessarily intending to follow through on this. He's no. a bit of a slacker. So and, he was always like, a, well, if there's a ship that's going. And so he goes down to the, uh, the, the Siemens hall where they, they, you know, they get signed. It's like the Siemens union. And he's like, Hey, did any happen to me? Ships going to Vietnam. Yeah. There's one leaving from Jersey. Oh, it's probably not leaving for a while. Right? No, no. The, this afternoon at three, uh, they probably don't need an oil man, though. That's that's my you know thing. It's, they probably don't need one. They probably thought, oh, you're in luck. They do. They need an oil man. It's like so, it, everything lines up that he needs to go. The 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 level of coincidence here gives me a little bit of a shiver. It exceeds the level of the odds. Yeah. Um. It feels like. Somebody really wants him to go. Right. And this is, you know, it's a, it's a ship full of ammo going to Vietnam. It takes months to get there. And then when he gets there, he he's given, the captain gives him 72 hours to go to, to have shore leave. He doesn't tell the captain what he's doing because it's idiotic. Well, well, in fact, he lies to the captain about why he needs shore yeah. leave. He makes up this tall tale that is just completely Step fiction. Stepbrothers, dad died. We need to get up, you know, to see him, to tell him before, you know, in person. So he goes and he he's this combination of naive and courageous. Like he's got this natural courage and confidence, self-confidence, and this naivete about marching into a war zone. He And p- part of it is, how does he get to these different places? It's not like he can't, he's like, oh, just hitchhike. You can't hitchhike in a war zone. But it turns out if you walk around dressed like in a civilian clothes on these different bases and these places, People think you're a CIA, like you're a tourist, quote unquote, which means CIA agent. And he keeps like walking around and people just just assuming he's CIA. He doesn't say that he is. In fact, he comes right out. If, so, if he's asked, it's like, oh, I'm on a beer run. I have to bring some beers to this base up north. And they, everyone keeps assuming it's a euphemism for some top secret thing. <laughs> He's like telling them the truth. And so he ends up like getting a helicopter into this fire base. And he's, it's a big gag. I don't want to spoil it. Right, right. But in any case, um, he, so it's, he's played by Zac Efron and Russell Crowe is in it also as a, uh, 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 not associate press. Oh, look magazine, war correspondent photographer. And, one of the things that struck me about it is it's not like platoon or a lot of those Vietnam war movies of, of the say the eighties and nineties, it's got a different feel to it. It To me, my, my, my feeling was it feels like a war movie about Vietnam that could only have been made after Iraq and Afghanistan. Right. Uh, the, the, yeah. the view of, of the, the complicated way it looks at supporting the troops while not necessarily supporting the war. Or the politicians. Or the politicians. It really does feel like a My Generation's Vietnam movie. Right. If you watched Platoon or, oh, I'm trying to think of the other ones. Full Metal Jacket. Full Metal Jacket. You always had, like, there's the, the guys who went crazy, the soldiers who were maniacs and there was this sort of uh, critic crit, criticism of the soldiers not criticism is in the word but this portrayal of them as out of control often and just it was like a ma- mad and crazy and and you didn't have that there's you kind of dials it back a little bit to yeah the war is terrible war is bad we shouldn't be there but the soldiers they're patriots. And in fact, if I had to, like, I would say that the the portrayal of the soldiers that he encounters feels more like the portrayal of the soldiers in Saving Private Ryan. I would say the entire yeah. t- tenor of the movie feels a little bit more like Saving Private Ryan than any other war movie I can think of. Like, that's the closest analogy for the... yeah the emotional temperature of the movie. I mean, this one has a little more humor. Yeah. Than Saving Private Ryan, which yeah, Saving Private Ryan was not a, was not a funny movie. There was, I mean, this one wasn't like a comedy. No, but Chicky was kind of 
uh, comic characters at times. Right. There, there are times where he is, he is absolutely a comic character. There are times when it, he really slides over into serious drama, something a lot less comic and a lot more like it's a very interesting actually where the genre fits because it's not really a comedy, even though the premise, the title, the character are all very comic. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, it's not, it's a, it's a drama, but yeah, yeah. It's so, and even the portrayal of the, of the reporter, the photographer played by Russell Crowe is a different sort of portrayal than the typical cynical, you know, he's, he's a realist about the war. He, yeah, the politicians are lying to us. The generals are lying. But he's not like, and everything is terrible and America sucks and all this other, you know, he's, it's different from from that. It was definitely more nuanced than I expected. There were cynical journalists in the in the pool of journalists that he meets. Right. But Russell Crowe's character was more nuanced than yeah. than I expected him to be. And that surprised me, actually. Yeah, there weren't a lot of caricatures in this movie. That's the thing. There weren't stereotypes in it. It was, I mean, it was, it's not the greatest movie ever. It's not going to win an Oscar or whatever. No. But well, it was good. It was enjoyable. I'm glad I watched it. Definitely. And and true story. I mean, a lot of the, the, the stuff you, that happens is true. I want to know. Which is mind-blowing. I want to know, is, is there a book and can I read yes. it? Yes, it's based on the book "The Greatest Beer Run Ever" by John Donahue and Joanna Malloy. I, I want to read the book now, actually, because I want to see like what they kept from the book and what they might have changed. <laughs> How much of this actually happened? Because right, it's astonishing at times. Because I, because you know they change some things for the movie. Of they course. always do. They so condense in this. Now I want to know what parts of it were, were true, or at least what parts of it are mm-hmm. from his narrative. Now what. We won't even get into the like how much of his story was true. Right. right. Because we can't know that. Yeah. But a lot of fun. Uh, I, I, I recommend it. Yeah, definitely. All right. Let's switch to things we've read. We're pushing up on an hour here, so we want to move along. Um, but I had mentioned last time that this year I intend to read a lot more books. Right. I have finished my first book this in one week, the first week, one book. I'm on a pace to read 52 books this year. Woo-hoo. That's a pace after reading one book. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> but uh, I finished the Tom Clancy novel uh, Red Winter, written by Mark Cameron. Tom Clancy's Red Winter. Tom Clancy died some years ago. And so other uh, authors have picked up his characters. The interesting thing about this is it takes place in 1985. It's set in 1985, uh, featuring... The original Jack Ryan, uh, the 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 dad of this, the 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 current novels feature the son, Jack Ryan Jr. So this features the original dad, and a lot of the characters we've come to know or show up in it. It takes place a lot of it in East Germany, in East Berlin, in fact, and it has to do with the F one seventeen stealth fighter and defectors and the Soviets and the Stasi and so um, so like classic. Yes. Cold War. Classic, era. Cool, right. Except instead of taking place in the 60s, like like the like the books that we read in in the 1980s, it takes place in the 80s because for a lot of people, that's the old days of the Cold War. Uh huh. So one of the things that we talked about that kind of pulls me out of sto- these types of stories when they're set in a time that I'm aware of is mm-hmm. sometimes authors like the authors will often make. Topical references, time, like they'll refer to music of the day or, you know, other pop culture things of the day that really create, make it feel like that era. Okay. You know, sometimes the characters will have to find a a payphone because they don't have cell phones and that sort of things. And when they're trying to track down somebody, they can't just ping his phone, etc. But there's a, another kind of thing that kind of bugs me when with this Wait, sort so of the, that that part doesn't bug you. That part doesn't being, bug you. You're me. not being clear, right? Sorry, that part doesn't bug me. What does bug me is, and we've we've figured it out what it is. I had a hard time articulating it, but what it is is when the author writes something in such a way that the reader knows something that the author does that the character not the author the character doesn't. For example, 
just not, this isn't in the book, but like say the character's like, oh, and then he saw that, you know, was looking for a coffee and there was this little coffee house called named after a character in Moby Dick, Starbuck. Eh, it seemed OK, but I don't think it's going anywhere. And then the, the reader goes, ha ha, that's going to be a huge chain. Wow, you're silly and I know more than you. And it's a it it's too cutesy by half. I just, I just don't like when the it feels like pandering to the reader. So this book did that. There were a few, very few moments early on where that happened. Very few, which I'm grateful for. Tom Clancy himself wrote a novel before he died. One of the last ones that Clancy wrote that I read called Red Rabbit. And it took place in. 1980, was that the year that Pope John Paul was shot? It surrounded the, uh, the, the events surrounding the shooting of Pope John Paul. And I, I got, it was a giant book because when you get to be Tom Clancy, you, nobody edits you anymore. Uh, and it needed an editor. But I, like the first chapter had all this stuff about Jack investing in this little company called uh, America Online, or I don't know if it was AOL, it was something. And I'm like, I think it might even been been Starbucks. I don't know. But it was like, ugh, it just felt so pandering to the reader. So I don't know what the... Wink, the winking word. at the reader? Yeah. You know, and sort of like Self, unearned... Self-consciously? Yeah. I, I just didn't like it. I, it just, it, it felt weird to me. And I was, and it was, and he was going on and on and on. He was spending way too much time having fun with that sort of thing instead of advancing the story uh so that book I, I never finished but this one didn't fall into that trap which i'm glad to to see so it was it was good it, i enjoyed it um one of the better of the tom clancy novels written by others that i've read in a while so uh, i i recommend that one you had a couple books that you finished i did i have actually got three books down on my 2023 <laughs> but one of but them, we're not bragging or anything no no <laughs> uh, Honestly, the Goblin Emperor, I had like a quarter of the book left uh, on January 1st. So I finished that on New Year's Day. Um, I, I'm counting it, but it's kind of sliding in there. Uh, but I did finish two books this week. I finished The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon, um, which is a mystery novel. Uh, the first person narrator is an autistic teenage boy and I there were things about the, the story that I liked there was a lot about it that I did not like and looking around on the internet to kind of help me to figure out what what my feelings were about the book I found an article by an autistic woman who talked about like evidently in an interview the author said that like his entire research for this point of view from an autistic boy's his entire research was reading a couple of articles on autism. Mm. It felt like he got a lot of the externals, like the um, meltdowns because of overstimulation from noise and from people that felt kind of true. A lot of the patterns of thinking and the lack of empathy just didn't ring true for me. It feels very much like the negative stereotype of autism. And now this is a book that's, I think, about 20 years old. And so some of that is perhaps it's a book very much of its day. Okay. Um, but neither of the parents are at all sympathetic. They both are kind of, frankly, abusive. And... I don't feel like there's any voice in the narrative, in the story. I mean, since it's a first-person narrative, that limits the amount of information and knowledge that the character can have. But there's no voice in the story ever that really stands up and says, hey, the way these guys are treating them is not okay, and it's not justified by the fact that he's autistic. Right. And the way maybe one friend suggested that perhaps one of the reasons that the character was lacking in so much empathy was because he was had never really known love and didn't know how to make connections, because it is not true that autistic people are lacking in empathy and 
they have difficulty in communication, but it's not because they don't care about people or have empathy for people. In fact, it's often too much empathy. And this character felt much more like the stereotype of, I don't care about anyone else. And in fact, in one point in the novel, he has a dream in which everybody on earth except the autistic people die and he's happy. Which felt really just Mm -hmm. cold and awful. I did not really like this book. Um, So... (laughs) <laughs> so that book so that book then i really did like the second book that i read which was sea of tranquility by emily st john mandel or probably sinjin mandel i think it's sinjin probably she's i think she's originally from canada but lives in yes. new york yeah. sea of tranquility is clearly a novel written during covid lockdown but it's not about covid lockdown it's a time travel novel um, however, the other Emily St. John Mandel novel that I've read was Station Eleven, which was a bestseller. And has become an HBO se- Max which is, series. Yeah, now yeah. Is, is a TV series. Uh, Station Eleven became very much as top of conversation during the COVID lockdown because it's a novel, a, it's a post-apocalyptic novel about a pandemic and the survivors of said pandemic. Sea of Tranquility is a time travel novel. There are some pandemics mentioned in it as the characters travel back and forward and forth in time. Um, there is one character who is a novelist who has written a best-selling novel about a pandemic and is at one point in the story in lockdown and is being asked by journalists what it's like to have written a best-selling novel about a pandemic during a pandemic. <laughs> I felt that that was a definitely an autobiographical moment. <laughs> right. And there was a very self-referential and a little bit of a wink. And I kind of felt like there was a, there was a layer in this novel, which was her working through being in COVID lockdown. But that did not at all ruin the novel for me. It made it feel like kind of, a novel that was written in a particular time and place, but it was a really good time travel novel. Mm. Um, It's kind of interesting. So there's basically four main point of view characters. And we first see the novel, uh, we see see each individual slice of time through their points of view. So we get, um, I'm looking over your shoulder. Edwin, 1912. Edwin in 1912, Marilla in 2020, Olive in 2203 and then Gaspari in 2401. And there is a time traveler and there is a connection between all of these people, but that's kind of the mystery at the heart of the novel. Um, There are pandemics like in 2020, obviously the story is going to reference COVID. I really liked the way it did this where the time traveler shows up and he's like, don't worry, I, you know, COVID isn't really transmissible by touch, uh, fomites, blah, blah, blah. And everyone looks at him like he's crazy. And he's like, oh, wait, it's only January. Right. <laughs> now, we were talking about the sort of self-referential moments. And I thought they can be done badly. This one was done really well. It really felt like it pinpointed, oh, that guy's a time traveler and you don't know it until he says that. And then you're like, Oh yeah. (laughs) I liked the way that she used that device to introduce the character who knows that there's a pandemic in 2020, but isn't quite down to when people would know about it at what times and places. So that was kind of fun. Mm. Um, I really liked it. Uh, I really liked the heart of the novel is a, about really humanity and art and what keeps us sane and what makes us human, which was very much about Station Eleven too. Station Eleven is sort of how do we pick up the pieces of our humanity after civilization has fallen? And there, one of the answers is a troop of traveling Shakespeare players, which is one reason why I love right. Station Eleven. <laughs> of course. Um, Shakespeare gets a couple glancing mentions in Sea of Tranquility, not quite as much. But I really feel like after reading these two books, I want to go back and read more of her fiction because I really 
like I like her stuff. Apparently, her novel Glass Hotel, mm-hmm. uh, it was actually really well recommended. But some of the the uh, characters from twenty twenty in this also show up in that book. Oh, fun! Yeah. So there's some nice crossover. Yes, and the uh, the nineteen twelve character, according to Wikipedia, is loosely based on the author's great grandfather. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I liked him. He was. Um, when we first see him, he's in the Canadian, exploring the Canadian wilderness. Um, and then we later see him after the first world war as a wounded veteran. Mm. Um, and I kind of liked what she did with his character. So that's interesting. So that's what we've been reading and watching. Uh, let's do a quick little bit on the gospel readings for the Feast of Epiphany. Before we go, um, we're running long uh, this week. So um, I do want to mention Father Leo was the celebrant this week. And he talked about the star of Bethlehem as being the GPS for the Magi. And each, and he said, each of us have been gifted with a star to guide us at our baptism. The, the star of our vocation. We are following our vocation. The stars are guiding us every day of our life. Uh, and then he, he also mentioned this idea where they ask, where do you live? Where are you from? Let's see, what was it? Um, uh, they've come to do in King Herod. Um, where is the newborn king of the Jews? No, I think he was ref- he was referencing um, the gospel reading from earlier in the week, one of the daily oh, readings right. where... Uh, we we get Bartholomew, um, Phil, we get Philip and Andrew, the the disciples of John. That's right. Um, John says, "Behold, the Lamb of God," and they go and follow Jesus. And they say, "Where are you staying?" And he says, "Come and see." Right. And then later they go and talk to uh, Bartholomew, and he he also says, "Come and see." So there was a little bit of going. So this repeated, you know, idea of. Finding Jesus, come and see, you know, either being pointed to him or following some sign to him. Um, And um, he said that, you know, especially with Bartholomew and Andrew, growth and knowledge requires making changes in our lives, changing where we live. You know, that that to grow always requires change. You know, you can't stay the same and grow. Um, Sort of like if you want a plant to grow, you're going to need to repot it. You know, you're going to, it needs a bigger pot, needs to move outdoors, be in the sun. And so growth bring requires change. And these magi who came from the East, you know, they, they had to go, you know, they, they were compelled to follow the star, to find the newborn King of the Jews to give him homage, to bring him these gifts. You know, one of the things I was talking about um, earlier in this week was that the relics of the Magi are in the cathedral in Cologne, Mm -hmm. which then raises so many questions for me because what was their life after? After. Were they, were they eventually baptized? Were they evangelized by the apostles at some point? They would have been fairly old men, but how did they get from there are kingdoms in the East to Germany. How right. do we know that these are their relics? What's their story? Like that leaves so many questions for me. Um, and then reading, you know, T.S. Eliot's Journey of the Magi, as I do every year, he imagines the Magi, the, the narrator, the, one of the Magi, as an old man saying, you know, I should be glad of another death. Hmm. Um, so the uh, relics of the Magi, were in Constantinople. Aha. Uh-huh. And then were brought to Milan uh, in 314. But how did they know in Constantinople that these were the Magi? Like, what's the story of the relics? That's what uh, I want to know. Yeah. Yeah. It would be interesting. Uh, yeah. It doesn't say. I love finding out about these stories, like, like the story of, you know, St. Helen finding the true cross. We know. We know it was the true cross because she had a vision and also because it raised someone from the dead. Yeah. See, the there are t- martyrdom traditions regarding them. 
that um, they were martyred for their faith and the bodies were first venerated in Constantinople. So they went back to their own country. Two separate traditions have surfaced claiming that they were so moved by their encounter with Jesus that they either became Christians on their own or were quick to convert fully upon later encountering an apostle of Jesus. The traditions claim that they were so strong in their beliefs that they willingly embraced martyrdom. I mean, that's a really great ending. I, I love, I love the tradition. Yeah. One of the things that Malcolm Geet said in a, in a lecture I listened to recently, he was talking about the infancy narratives of Mary, um, which are part of the, the uh, apocryphal gospel of James. Mm -hmm. And we don't necessarily believe that they are inspired scripture or that they are true historical accounts. But what, and that's always made me feel uncomfortable. Then, like, then what are we to do with them? But I like the category he gave. They are early Christian fiction. They're in fact, kind of fan fiction of the gospels. So what they tell us is what our Christian imagination does with the stories that we don't have answers to. So even if the stories of the Magi are filling in the blanks that we do not have a historical record for, the stories that we tell about them still tell us something about Christianity, about ourselves, about our relationship with God, even if they aren't strictly historical. Mm. And I'm, I'm finding an interesting space in that, like, Christian imagination. How do we imagine the outside of the Gospels? <laughs> You had something you wanted to read about the gold frankincense and myrrh. Oh yeah, so I was reading. Um, Meg Hunter Kilmer has a book that's out. Um, it's like a, a Bible in a year journal, and so she's been sharing on her Facebook page some excerpts from it. And I really liked her meditation on the gifts of the Magi. She points out, um. That there's more to myrrh than the anointing of a corpse and more to the Christ child than just one born to die. In the Old Testament, myrrh also anointed the tabernacle, the priest, and the royal bridegroom. And that last, the royal bridegroom, is the only other verse where frankincense and myrrh appear together as Solomon, the son of David, was anointed for his bride in the Song of Songs. So... I love that, that what we see in the Christ child receiving myrrh, I've always just heard myrrh is for death, myrrh is for a corpse. Mm -hmm. I'd never heard this tradition of myrrh being for the tabernacle or the royal bridegroom or the priest. That is new to me as well. I haven't heard that. Whether they knew it or not, the Magi were declaring Jesus to be king, priest, presence of God, and bridegroom Messiah. Isn't that wonderful? Mm. Jesus is the bridegroom from his birth. He was born to be the the bridegroom. The bridegroom, yeah. That's to wed the church. Right. I really love that. So that just kind of blew my mind today. <laughs> uh and then she ends with um they called him the king of the Jews, the same title that would be nailed to the cross with him. The first Gentiles to be drawn to Jesus followed God's call even when they didn't entirely understand it, because they abandoned themselves to follow God, they proclaimed the gospel from the cradle to the cross. Nice. All right. So before we go, we want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create Raising the Bets, including David F., Lee V., Sean F., Deacon Al V., and Michael D. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue raising the bets and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And that's it for this time. Find links from our discussion in our show notes at sqpn.com slash bets. That's B-E-T-T-S. Send your feedback at the StarQuest Facebook page, facebook.com slash StarQuest Media. Send us an email at bets at sqpn.com or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. Remember to like Raising the Bets on the StarQuest Facebook page at facebook.com slash StarQuest Media. 
Retweet us on Twitter at SQPN and leave us comments wherever you find us. We love to interact with you. Until next time, I'm Dom Bettinelli. And I'm Melanie Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Raising the Bets on StarQuest. Here's another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy. Let's Science. Find the show wherever fine podcasts are found or at sqpn.com slash science.